I want to talk about my first day in prison. So just after my 18th birthday, I committed a robbery and an unrelated shooting. I was quickly arrested. I pleaded guilty to all the crimes I committed and I was sentenced to 32 years in prison. So as this 18 year old kid, I was lost and I didn't know what to think. And sitting in the jail for all that time, I'd heard these stories about prison about like, oh, it's so violent and you'll see dudes getting raped and it's that I didn't know what to believe. I had no idea what I was expecting because at the same time I was hearing all these horror stories, guys were telling me, oh, but man, it's so much better down the road and oh, you, you can't wait. You, it'll, it'll be like freedom when you get there. This didn't make a lot of sense to me. So I get to prison. First, I got to a receiving prison. I thought like, okay, this is going to be it. And then everybody tells me like, no, no, this isn't real prison. Like we were locked down 23 and one. We got an hour out. No, I think it was 22 and two. We got an hour outside, an hour just in the kind of common area. But it was like old school, like three tiers with bars. Like it looked like something out of a 70s movie. And there was not a lot of freedom. There was no class. There was no work. There was no anything. It was just basically being locked in the cell, getting some time outside, and then being locked back in the cell. <clears throat> so finally, I get to this real prison. Like, it was a level four out of six. Virginia now has five levels in S, but it used to be six levels. And guys had told me of the three level fours that I could go to, this was going to be probably the, the middle one. Like, Keen Mountain was supposed to be really sweet and strict, but, like, really sweet. Sussex was supposed to be really bad, but this one would be really good. So... I get there and I'm like, I don't know what to believe. And while we're on the bus there, the guard is telling these stories about, oh, and this gang thing happened and oh, so-and-so got stabbed up. And so I don't know what to expect. I'm like, this, am I gonna walk into a war zone? Am I gonna be like ducking under things? And we got there and we had to go through property and going through property was surprisingly uh, easy and comfortable. Like the guy gave me a cigarette. The officer literally gave me a cigarette because I had been told I couldn't bring an open container of tobacco from a receiving prison to a level four, they would take it. So I had like hidden a bunch of cigarettes in my thing, but like didn't take a container. So he like found all these little loose cigarettes. He was like, what are you doing? I was like, man, they told me I couldn't bring my tobacco. He was like, really? Who told you that? So he like taps out his pack of Marlboros and like hands me a cigarette. And I was like, this cop just gave me a cigarette. Like, anyways, so it was way more laid back and way more comfortable and decent than I thought. So we go and we're getting pushed through to, to get to the pod. And the first one we go through is locked. So I look in and like everybody's, you know, locked in their cells and they've got these grates on the doors and grates on the windows. And it looks like the hole, like it was, it was terrible. I was thinking, God, I'm just going to be sitting in here locked in all day? Like, does this mean they have riots and they have to do this? I had no idea what to expect. So they finally push us to the pod that I'm going into and they open the door and it's just people living their lives. It's like people on the phone and people walking to the shower and drinking coffee and playing cards and talking trash and like hanging out on the top tier. One guy was like over in the corner drawing. It was just a normal life. It almost reminded me of like a college dorm. And then so I, I walked in and I kind of looked around. Nobody really paid attention to me. It was me and another guy went to the same cell. There's another guy who went upstairs. Nobody cared. Like I, the guy that I went in the cell with ended up knowing a couple of the guys upstairs. So he went and dapped them up and talked to them for a little bit. But it was just a normal life. And so I kept waiting, like waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like where's the violence? Where's the this? Where's the chaos? And it didn't come. Well, at least it didn't come for three days. So three days in, uh, the way they would do breakfast is they would open the doors. You would walk out of your cell. They would lo lock the doors back out. So everybody that wanted to go to breakfast was locked in the pod together. And then you'd wait for them to call breakfast, which could be you know, five minutes, it could be an hour, it could be two hours, you're just basically stuck there. So everybody's like half asleep and like miserable and like over in the corner. This one particular morning, it wasn't just quiet in the way that it is in the morning, like it was super quiet. Like it was clear something was going on. And all of a sudden these two guys start yelling at each other, Manny and uh, Cuba. And so they're like going back and forth, but they're like yelling in that kind of hushed tone that is trying not to get the attention of the person in the booth. So they're going back and forth and all of a sudden Cuba steps back and he pulls this giant knife out of his pants. It's like, I was expecting like ice picks or like something I saw in the movie or like stuff I'd seen guys make in the jail like with little pieces of metal. This was like a Rambo knife with like a handle and like a thing wrapped around his wrist. And I was like, oh my God. So Manny steps back, <clears throat> grabs his sock out of his pants and he's got something in it. So it looks like a mace. Found out later he's got locks in there. And I was like, okay, like this doesn't really look like a fair fight, but okay, whatever. So uh, Cuba sees that Manny has the, the mace, the lock and a sock. So he reaches over and those trash can lids, like the rounded ones, you have like a flap that you stick stuff in. He grabs that up and kind of like braces it on his arm. So he's got basically like a sword and a shield. And I was like, what am I about to see? Like, am I about to see somebody murdered at 5 a.m.? Like, this is not what I'm expecting. So <clears throat> they start kind of going back and forth and feigning. I think Cuba feigned. And when he did, Manny swung the lock and a sock. And I just want to explain to you, <clears throat> the effective use of a lock of a sock is to lock the sock excuse me, lock the lock onto the sock and then tie it closed so it can't go anywhere. The reason you do this is because if you put two locks inside a sock and it hits a trash can lid, the locks are gonna go flying in two completely different directions and you're gonna be holding an empty sock facing somebody with a sword and a shield, which is a profoundly unfair and really bad arrangement. So again, I didn't know what to expect. 
uh, Cuba starts chasing him around the pod, like, can he catch him? Like, is this going to be the end of it? What's going to happen? And in the middle of all this, they call Chow. So we all just start filing out because the whole rule is like you don't you don't draw attention to it like you don't let anybody see it you don't you just kind of mind your business so we go out to chow and i'm like well you know is, is he gonna be dead when we get back or are we gonna come find a body whatever and like five minutes later i see them walking down the the boulevard but separate i mean i don't know maybe like uh 50 people between them but like manny's coming first and then cuba's behind him and then they go back to the pod together and like everything's okay and i don't know what the settlement was i don't know if he paid him i have no idea what the issue was but I remember thinking, like, this is my life now? Like, people are going to just be sitting there having a normal life, try to kill each other, and then have breakfast together. Like, not at the same table, but, like, in the same room, and then go back. <clears throat> and I've seen other situations where people were entirely unwilling to, like, let things slide, or if something started, they would finish it, like, a year later, two years later. It wasn't, like, something that could die out. But that was when I just realized this place is insane and incomprehensible. And yeah, there are some clear rules. Like you don't look in somebody's cell. You don't touch somebody while they're sleeping. Like you wipe the toilet. Like you don't spit in the sink. These really simple rules. But at the same time, the rules of behavior weren't there. And I was one of those guys who always grew up thinking there was a right way. Like there was a right way to do everything. And if I could just figure it out, it'd be okay. So I came to prison like looking like, what are the rules? Like what am I supposed to do? Like if somebody does this, do I punch them in the face? And I tend to err on that side because a lot of guys built me up to that while I was in the jail and told me, oh yeah, you gotta do this. So I ended up getting myself in those situations. So just a few days after this thing happened with Manny in Cuba, I'm coming back to the pod from uh, Chow and the guys have been shooting dice down in the bottom tour. And I had a cell down in the bottom tier. So I come back and there are a bunch of guys like reaching in my cell, like fishing with a towel. And I didn't realize at the time, but they had let the dice go into the door and they were just trying to get the dice back. But at the same time, like that's a violation. You don't go into somebody's space. You don't go into somebody's cell. Like you just don't do that. But rather than go over and be like, look, this ain't cool, like I'm gonna get the dice, don't do that again, which would have been a much better option, I start screaming and raging and basically like beating my chest because everybody told me that's what I'm supposed to do, like make a scene of it. So I get halfway over there to the guy who's actually at the door and the guy clocks me from the side, just hits me, I end up on the ground. I don't know who hit me, I'm looking up at people, I manage to get away and I kind of step back and I'm looking, I still don't even know who hit me. Like who am I supposed to go fight? What am I supposed to go do? And in the typical kind of prison way, there was like a little conference, like somebody came over to me, but was like, yo, dude's not gonna fight you, but somebody will fight you for him if you're trying to settle this, cause like he was in the wrong. So I go and I fight some guy in the cell who's 260 pounds, who's significantly bigger than me. And I remember I was like, I had done karate as a kid and I'd also wrestled, but I still had that instinct to like create space and try to fight from distance. So I'm in the cell with my back to the bunk. He steps in and as soon as he throws a punch, I kind of like jump back, I get a little bit of space. He just ran, slammed me into the bunk, like my upper body's on the top bunk, my lower body's on the bottom bunk. He takes, picks me up, hits my head on the ceiling, hits my head on the sink and slams me on the floor and I was just completely unconscious. So <clears throat> all, all that karate mentality, actually I've seen a karate fighter do really well in the yard, would not recommend it, so. <clears throat> Anyways, so I'm out completely unconscious, like everybody thought I was dead, other guys thought my skull was cracked, like they were debating whether to call medical, and this dude just didn't want to get a murder charge, or didn't want to get some fucking serious charges, they came in and found my body and somebody told on him. So when I finally woke up, like 15 years, or excuse me, 15 uh, minutes later, when the door was actually shut, because they do five minute cell breaks, so you're like in and out of the cell for five minutes and then they lock him for an hour. So he's got like Advil and crackers and like a bottle of water sitting on my, my uh, uh, what do you call it, my slot. And I got up and I was like, man, like, do I have to fight this guy again? Like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. He's like, bro, man, I'm sorry. Like, I hope, I hope you're okay. Like, I got you some Advil and some crackers. Like, make sure you don't go to sleep. Like, I think you got a concussion. And I was like, again, this is not what I was expecting. Like, but I realized in prison, there are these things that are respect fights, that they're about respect. They're about gaining or whatever. They're about testing somebody, engaging where they're at. And then you have like the real brutal, absolutely ugly ones where somebody's chasing the other guy around the pod with a knife and just stabbing him in the back until he's not moving. So it's like, which one is this and what does it look like? And what I found was I still could have died. Like this might've been a respect fight, but I got my head slammed on that ceiling and that sink and that floor so hard that they really thought I was dead. If I was unconscious for 15 minutes, it's entirely reasonable to believe that my skull was cracked or that I would die or that I would have some kind of edema. So I realized that it was a lot more serious. Even in these things that were supposed to be not a big deal, even the respect fights, and I did make a point to stay away from violence as long as I could. If there was a situation where I absolutely had to defend myself or absolutely had to do something, that was different, but I wasn't gonna jump out the window like that anymore. I wasn't gonna go and initiate something or allow it to get out of control that quickly because I realized this could be serious. Somebody could be dead, somebody could be permanently injured. Like whether that's me or somebody else, it does not make sense to go to that extreme if there's any other alternative. So that informed my, my kind of views on violence going forward. And I did get into other fights, or I did have other conflicts after that. But again, only when I absolutely had to. And the whole culture around it, the like, cool, like, yeah, I wanna go to prison, I wanna fight somebody, I wanna stab somebody. Like that, I was grateful that that experience kind of broke me out of that. Cause I think I had some of that like little kid allure of like, yeah, I wanna go make a name for myself. 
and I had enough people pointing me in the right direction. And I remember there was actually a kid who came in right about the same time that I did who had 30 years, so almost the same son as I did. And he was around the people who were telling him, no, man, you got to make a name for yourself. you got 30 years. Like, dudes ain't going to respect you. So all he wanted to do was stab somebody. Like, he just kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, his homeboy got into something. He made a point of going and stabbing the guy up for getting into it with his homeboy. And, like, that was his way of doing it. So we were walking to Chow when we were going by the jail cages where they let the, the uh, guys in the hole out for rec for an hour and, like, they can walk in the cage. And he's just back there. And I remember thinking, like, that could have been me. If I had had different people advising me and pointing me in that direction, that very well could have been me because I was just as scared or just as hungry for respect or attention as he was, but I had enough people pointing me in a positive direction. And enough people being like, look, dude, you might got to do 32 years, but you ain't got to do 40 or you ain't got to do 50 or you ain't got to do 100. Like, you can still have a future where some people didn't see that mindset. They were so myopic. They were stuck, so stuck in the kind of short term and then where they're at, they didn't see what they were giving up by living that life. So... In a weird way, the violence of prison and the normalcy of prison and everything really informed who I wanted to be moving forward because I always want to be looking towards a better life. Like whether it was in prison and hoping I could get out one day, now that it's out here in the world, hoping that I can prove the world for myself, for my family, for the people around me, for my community. Like I want to make things better. I don't want to, you know, get stuck in some short-sighted mindset. I don't want to punish people. I don't want to be punished by other people. I don't want to do anything that's going to cause harm. I've created enough harm in my life. I created a swath of harm on my way to prison. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've done a lot of terrible things. And I don't want to do that anymore. So in a weird way, the kind of brutality of prison and the people that were there that had learned from it helped me see that I don't have to live that way and that I can make a different future for myself and for others.